Recording in progress. And the main topics of this uh, school is the effective physical and biophysical cosmology. And so the location related to this time. And recent development in stepping amplitude, ultra amplitude method, etc. And machine learning, game learning, and quantum computing. Uh, we Arush members are very happy that we could invite world experts on these issues as the lecturers at this school. We wanted to have as many as the offline lecturers, but uh, still some of them could not make it because of these issues in the last moment. And uh, uh, in the lectures, there could be some overlap, which is unavoidable, and it should be fine because most audience are used to these topics. And I hope all of you learn a lot here and contribute by doing something new and interesting, uh, combining various ideas and techniques you learn from this school. And to the online attendance, please mute your uh, microphone unless you speak. If you have a question, please follow your microphone and also your video and speak. Or you can write your questions in the chat window. <laughs> And then the lecturers can read it. And for the offline attendance, uh, reference and cock break in front of the uh, this lecture hall. And then we will have a lunch together at the campus cafeteria on the first floor of the union building. And just to follow the locals uh, after the second lecture in the morning. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy all uh, this uh, uh, summer school. Thank you. So now, Clifford, uh, you are a uh, host, you can share your screen and start. Right, can you hear, uh, can, can you, you see me okay easier? right now? Wow, I'm even loud through the speaker. So I was uh, hoping to do a little experiment here, which was to actually do it in front of a blackboard, because I feel it's maybe a little bit more uh, dynamical and maybe we'll encourage more questions. So I would do that, is there a problem? Oh, okay. Okay, perfect. I think I can even see through the screen that, uh, yeah, that you can probably see the lettering. Okay, so as I said, I was uh, debating at some point whether to do this uh, on my iPad, kind of with the whiteboard streaming, and then I kind of realized that oftentimes in such talks, it, it, it feels a little stale and you can't see what I'm emphasizing because you can't actually see me physically. So I'm going to do an experiment, which is actually just give this lecture in my office. So I'm going to try to do it a little bit uh, larger print than I would even normally normally use. Okay, but hopefully uh, you can hear me and I think you can see me. Uh, also, if there's any questions, I'm not sure how this is going to work for those in the audience, uh, but you know, the more the more is asked of me, in real time, the more interesting and I think dynamical uh, this will be. Okay, let me see if I can uh, uh, zoom myself in here. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, before I start, let me first uh, thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak uh, for this set of lectures. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I apologize I couldn't be there in person. I actually very much wanted, have wanted to go to Korea. I've never been to Korea before. But I uh, did did the math in my head, which is that my passport had expired, uh, and it takes a long time to get passports. And in fact, my passport just arrived like last week, so I wouldn't have made it had I bought a flight, had I bought tickets. So uh, it would it would not have happened. So I'm actually glad it worked out this way, and that you can uh, uh, accommodate this online set of uh, lectures. So uh, uh, this is the very first lecture on um, scattering amplitudes, as was mentioned. There is a phenomenal group of, of lecturers that you'll see uh, in, in the week, in, in the coming week, experts on this kind of modern scattering amplitudes program, effective field theory, standard model EFT, a whole kind of gambit of interesting subjects. Um, 
I didn't want to, um, well, there's going to be, I believe, some overlap probably between what I talk about and what Eugene talks about. But basically, I want to introduce you to, kind of ease you into uh, what is basically known as the modern S matrix program. So pr presumably, many of you have heard this uh, terminology. Uh, it's essentially a reboot of the S matrix program of old, which was originally envisioned to understand the very complicated dynamics of QCD. Oh, wow, I can see myself in the back. Uh, uh, in front of you, so I can see all of you. Hello. Um, it was something which very famously failed uh, in its task before uh, quantum field theory and QCD rose to the occasion. And that is, of course, the modern understanding of how the strong interactions work. But, uh, you know, in, in the intervening period between, you know, 60s and 70s, when people are trying to understand S matrix theory to today, a lot has changed and a lot of new things have been learned. And, and the upshot is that all those ideas, which are basically you know, hinge upon throwing away the usual tenets of quantum field theory, like discarding the kind of standard paraphernalia that we use to compute, and instead uh, uh, bootstrapping things from the ground up. Okay, so uh, maybe just to, to to ground things in kind of actual text that that uh, you can read. Um, uh, some, but not all, of what I say uh, will are are from my TASI lectures on scattering amplitudes uh, at this archive number. I also very highly recommend. Uh, the, the archive review and book by uh, Yutin Huang, one of the other lecturers, and, and Henry Elvang. Phenomenal book. I view it as like almost uh, required reading for culture, for anyone who's interested in quantum field theory in general. When you read this book, you'll understand that there's other ways to think about series outside of QFT, which is basically what I want to talk about today. Okay. Now, uh, what is Amplitudes about? So if you go to an Amplitudes conference, an S-Matrix conference nowadays, uh, it's a really fascinating group of people from really uh, intellectually diverse places, okay? Uh, it used to be something which is very narrowly, maybe string theory, particle physics, maybe colliders. But in the last, let's say decade or so, there's been a real explosion, truly an explosion of just tentacles of amplitudes going off into other fields. So now when you go to amplitudes conferences, you see, of course, particle physics, string theorists. You now see hardcore mathematicians, like honest to goodness mathematicians. You see gravitational wave physicists who are really closely connected to uh, experiments. And that's because of some breakthroughs connecting amplitudes and gravitational waves relevant to Einstein's general relativity and the actual experiments, which I'll, I'll touch on. And I think you team's actually gonna unpack a fair amount more. And also other uh, kind of new connections like to cosmology, okay, applying the kinds of ideas I'll talk about today uh, to uh, uh, wave, the coefficients of the wave function of the universe to uh, uh, correlators that encode non-Gaussianity all these kind of interesting other physical observables. So the kind of, maybe before jumping in, I wanna emphasize that the idea and the, the kind of uh, basic perspective here is very general and actually transcends just, you know, transcends perturbative scattering amplitudes in flat space, okay? And in fact, maybe even towards the end of this set of lectures, I'm going to tell you how you can generalize very far from that uh, basic context. Okay, now this is the very first lecture on this and I wanna ease into things. So rather than just kind of hit you with a, a big amplitude, I wanna give you you know, some sense of why we are interested in amplitudes at all, okay? And uh, it really boils down, at least to me personally, uh, to a, a fundamental question about what series are and how you define them, okay? So the, I, I often bring this up in my kind of general talks on this, but I'm gonna start big and then zoom in. Here's a question you could just ask anyone on the street who does physics, what defines a theory? Okay, like what, what is actually the, the, the fundamental building blocks when I say theory exists, some dynamical structure that describes the world, what defines it? Okay. Now, the kind of common answer in, of course, if you go to most physics departments and you go to high energy uh, uh, physics group would be the action, right? So we take some action S, we write it as some D4X of some local Lagrangian. And then we write that Lagrangian out Hopefully you can see this, we write very big, let's say for some scalar field with some kinetic term and so on, okay? So we just say the Lagrangian with the action principle is the definition of the theory. Now, uh, this of course is a little bit simple-minded because you know that the Lagrangian, if you've gone through Weinberg's QFT one, two, and three, is not some mystical object. It's actually just a machine that we use in order to build physical principles automatically into a formalism. Okay, so what physical principles are actually built into this thing? Well, the physical principles, number one, is locality. Okay, so this the very fact that we wrote the action 
as the integral over one Lagrangian density. That's a function of one space time point. So that is to say, this is a function of LX, not a function of LX and X prime, okay? That is building in a very big assumption. Of course, not all physics is local, some is not, but in the vast majority of, uh, of scenarios that we're interested in, we, uh, we, we build this in, okay? This is just an assumption that's being input. On top of that, of course, we build in things like Lorentz invariance, okay? We contract all indices with mu, and then we could fold in other symmetries, okay? We could throw it in global symmetries, um, I'll get to gauge symmetries in a second. Um, you know, any kind of structure or principle you like. Okay. Now, from this point of view, okay, this whole setup is merely a machine to take principles that, that you have understood more abstractly or measured in experiments and hard code them into this formalism from the very start. Okay. Now, uh, you can, of course, well, let me, let, me, let me unpack that a bit more. From this point of view, parameters in a Lagrangian have a much different character. Okay, usually when you write a parameter in a Lagrangian, like the Higgs boson mass squared or the uh, theta QCD or whatever the cosmological constant, whatever parameter you happen to be most interested in, you just imagine there's a bunch of operators that are allowed and you write them down and that's fine. From the point of uh, a principled uh, 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 analysis like this, the idea is you fix every parameter you can from physical principles and everything not fixed by that is free. Okay, so basically every coupling constant or mass here, which is not fixed by some principle, is something which can take on different values. And that means an experimentalist measures it because they could measure one value or a different value because it wasn't fixed by a principle. So from that point of view, everything an experimentalist can measure, which is could be any value, is just the parameters that are unfixed by principles. Everything that they're checking to check a principle needs to be fixed by principles. Okay, that's why the 19 or so free parameters of the standard model, depending on you count, you should just think of as all the things not fixed by principles in the standard model, uh, uh, given what we've input into it, which is uh, the structure of the forces, Lorentz invariance, locality, and so on. Okay. Now, if I were to now um, abstract away from that, my basic point here, right when I start, and again, I'm, I'm starting in the big picture, is that the normal way we think about theories is we start with the Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, or let's say equations of motion. Okay, you can see that. And then we compute from that amplitudes. Okay, scattering amplitudes, or let's say really any obser observable. It could be a correlation function. It could be, uh, uh, well, those are, those are the kind of two, two most uh, uh, prominent uh, types of observables. It could be a free energy. It could be anything that's kind of uh, 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 observable that's gauge invariant and physical. And very often we think of this as, you know, the kind of s s the second step, right? We first start with the theory here and then we define the amplitude from it. Now, of course, this is fixed by principles, as I just said, which could be things which I'll unpack in this talk, like Lorentz invariance, locality, uh, other principles, uh, whatever you like. And also maybe, uh, maybe I'll call them luxuries, not principles, but things you might want the world to have, but aren't guaranteed to have, like supersymmetry or extra dimensions or, or other, other extra symmetries in nature. Okay, now the whole point of the S matrix bootstrap is to basically cut, cut this whole middle uh, piece out and just directly compute the amplitudes. Okay, and that's what I'm gonna spend uh, the maybe first half of this talk, this uh, set of lectures describing, which is that procedure. It sounds very ill-defined. What do I mean build the amplitudes from the principles? But let me just say it in very quickly in words and then we'll unpack it and do it explicitly. The idea is take whatever kinematic observable you have that is of interest. It could even be a correlator in principle, cosmological correlator, it could be in, uh, a Witten diagram in ADS, it could be an on shell scattering amplitude, whatever. Write it in terms of the kinematic variables that are natural to that setup, okay? And simply write down an ansatz for that function, okay? Now, of course, the space of functions of kinematic variables is infinite a priori, so you need to make assumptions, okay? The most powerful assumption we always make in amplitudes is perturbative, which fixes essentially that very simple functions happen at low orders, essentially. Um, but we'll see how maybe towards the end, how that can uh, uh, that, that, that general setup can be extended uh, uh, to very general contexts. But the idea is you build a function and then you make an onsets with free parameters. Then you take whatever menu of principles that you uh, are, have dear to your heart, and then you literally impose those principles directly onto the amplitudes. Okay, very directly. So you have an ansatz and you constrain it to those set of principles. Okay, depending on what they are, they will fix coefficients in that ansatz. Now, let's say you 
you know, you keep fixing more and more principles and you go from your 19 parameter theory down to, let's say one parameter, okay? You, you, you fix the whole bunch of principles and you got one literal amplitude with a single parameter. Then you've kind of constructed a really elegant theory, which has no free parameters by construction, which is, if you like, uh, uh, the kind of simplest theory that isn't trivial. And what I mean by that is if you then took that theory and imposed other non-trivial principles, then you'll find that that last parameter has to be zero, right? So if you over-constrain, if you demand too much of a theory, you can also rule out an amplitude altogether, okay? So that's why this kind of bootstrap picture is very powerful. Not only can you relearn facts about the world, which we will in this, in this set of lectures, like the fact that gauge theories, gravity are, are not, you know, mysterious things that some brilliant person wrote, but are actually, you know, very strongly dictated by basic principles, you know, almost unique in structure. Um, uh, we learn things like that, but you also learn that if you demand too much of a theory, too many symmetries, then the theory fights back and makes itself trivial because there aren't enough free parameters to, for that to happen. So this is also a powerful way of actually ruling out theories in the abstract, okay? So there's very explicit examples of this that I'll even mention where you take a theory and you, uh, you give it a spectrum, you give it some properties and you just de determine without even writing a Lagrangian that it's an inconsistent theory because the principles you wrote down are not consistent with any function that reflects these principles. Okay, good. Um, uh, any questions? Yeah, I'll say that occasionally, although I'm not sure that you have the, the ability to communicate uh, to me, but if you can, you can raise your hand or I'm not sure how this works. But in any case, um, uh, let me now, um, yeah, let me unpack this a bit. So one thing you could immediately ask, which is why, why bother with this? This seems like a very complicated way to do something we know how to do already, which is perturbation theory, okay? Of course there exists Q of T, there exists Feynman diagrams, like whole formalism that's incredibly useful. And at no point am I saying any of that's wrong. Of course, it's all correct. Those calculations are, are, are true, the ones done in quantum field theory. But um, there's two reasons to do it this way. Okay, the first has to do with the fact that Feynman diagrams are just immensely complicated. I'm going to unpack that in kind of great detail subsequently. That's the kind of next thing I'll do. But the kind of corollary to that, which we'll get into, is that by stepping away from Feynman diagrams and just computing things in a much more direct fashion, we can actually learn about new structures that are completely invisible on the usual Q of T side. Okay? So uh, roughly speaking, that's what my lectures will be split between. Okay. The first half will be about the bootstrap, which is to say building amplitudes from the ground up just so you understand the mechanics of it, how it can teach us old things uh, about QFT. And then we're going to slowly kind of work our way to the new things. Uh, uh, very, in, in, in my view, completely incredible underlying structures within theories of nature like Einstein's general relativity, uh, the strong interactions, classic theories. Uh, new structures that have no understanding in terms of kind of standard symmetry of Lagrangian properties. Okay. Really nutty things, um, which which uh, there's many of, but I'll, I'll focus on just a couple. Okay, now let me kind of dive maybe a bit more into the details here. And I'm going to erase this. These are just the references I was mentioning. Okay. So the first thing I said was that Feynman diagrams are very complicated. But I maybe wanted to litigate through that claim just a bit more because it's, it's always a little bit... Uh, a little bit um, sneaky when we say that, okay? Uh, of course, if you've used Feynman diagrams, you know they're quite complicated. Usually what one says in a, in a talk like this on amplitudes is just there's so many of them. You just count them and there's so many, okay? So uh, let's, let's, uh, let's really dig into um, that counting. How bad really are Feynman diagrams? And I'm kind of doing this, so we're kind of going through the shallow end of the pool and kind of work our way to the more exotic types of amplitude methods. And uh, the re the, what, what I want to introduce is the notion of recursion, which existed long before on-shell amplitudes. Okay? And you kind of know this from calculating Feynman diagrams. If you ever did this for a problem set or some class, you know that when you computed the three-point amplitude, <clears throat> you got some answer. When you computed the four-point amplitude, well, maybe you just restarted and computed from scratch. But if you were kind of really smart about things, you would have taken the answer you computed at three-point and funneled it into four-point as input. You would have recycled, right? The, the very nice thing about Feynman diagrams is, is they have a naturally nested structure because you have a Feynman diagram and it's built from lower order topologies glued to higher order topologies, okay? Which is why there is a notion of recursively using lower point Feynman diagrams into higher point Feynman diagrams, which is known as Barron's Gila recursion, okay? So let me, let me get into that now. 
<laughs> so if you like, none of this is, is, uh, is truly on-shell amplitude stuff, but I'm gonna use this as a kind of cute uh, segue to counting and kind of quantifying how bad Feynman diagrams are and asking whether that's even a meaningful question. Okay, so this is called Barron's Gila recursion. This is a very old idea. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm abusing notation a little bit, uh, but I wanna give you the heart of what it really is, um, which is essentially using equations of motion to solve for the S matrix. Okay, so let me take like the simplest possible theory you can imagine, which is phi cube theory. And so by phi cube theory, I just mean uh, literally a Lagrangian of a scalar field with a cubic interaction. Okay. Now the idea of, um, of, of such a formalism is you write down the equations of motion. Okay. So if you don't know the story, uh, well, it's good that you see it. Uh, otherwise it's good to see it multiple times because it's a very kind of classic uh, fact um, related to many things like uh, Schwinger Dyson and so on. But uh, the idea is the following. Write down the equation of motion for phi cubed in the presence of a source. Okay, so this lambda phi squared over two is simply the phi cubed equation of motion, uh, a vertex as it shows up in the equation of motion. And this is the uh, usual propagator. Okay, now the, the, the statement here is that you can actually solve perturbatively for the full S matrix by iteratively solving this equation of motion in the presence of arbitrary sources J. Okay, uh, again, since this probably should be, I think, review for most of you, let me just sketch what I mean by that. So the idea is you think of phi as literally some function which you're solving for as a functional of J. <clears throat> you expand it order by order in lambda. So I write it as phi zero, lambda phi one, plus lambda squared phi two and so on, okay? And you solve it order by order precisely the way you'd solve, you know, if you like an algebraic equation, a nonlinear algebraic equation, you could solve this way just by perturbing in lambda, okay? So the idea being first you set lambda to zero. <clears throat> okay? When lambda goes to zero, you get the definition of the Green's function, which tells you that phi zero equals one on box J. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, phi zero is the solution when lambda is zeroth order, that is to say, is set to zero. We solve phi equals one on box j, and that's the leading order solution. Okay, and we can draw this thing as something attached, if you like, some insertion of phi at some position x, which is sourced by j. Okay, this is just the Green's function, uh, x convolved in with j. Now, when you plug this solution, back into the equation of motion, you can then solve for the second order. And what you find is a diagram where your leading order solution is glued together twice with the lambda sitting in front, which is the coupling constant. Okay. So what you find is this piece has two J's in it and it, it's uh, uh, precisely the three point function and so on and so forth. You can keep gluing these together. Okay. Now from this, what you build is a functional, I should really call this phi, which is a functional of J, which is uh, essentially the first derivative of the generating functional of, uh, of, of uh, correlators, okay? You can see that if you just differentiate this object with respect to J and extract uh, the various correlators, then you'll get encoded inside this, all the endpoint functions. Okay, so this is kind of at the basic level why you could say that phi cube theory is complicated because as this goes higher and higher, there's a huge number of diagrams. But of course, we know that there's some simple, even recursive structure within QFT to solve this. Okay. Let me show you an amusing trick now for actually counting diagrams. Okay, any questions about that? All right. Um, so how would you count diagrams? Okay, this is actually very hard to you know, compute the full S matrix, but let's say I didn't want to com compute the full S matrix. I merely wanted to count the number of diagrams that contribute at each order. Okay, well now we can do a trick, okay? So what I'm gonna do is a trick where I, I take this equation and I replace every diagrammatic element like the propagator and the vertex with one, okay? So this is no longer phi cube theory. This is if you like a toy scalar model. But I just erase that phi is equal to this and lambda is one. So this is me effectively taking the coupling constant, setting it to one, setting all the propagators to one, okay? And thinking of phi no longer even as a field, but just as a variable, okay? Now, as you can uh, uh, kind of anticipate, you can simply solve this equation for phi. 
Okay, so let's say we do that. 5j is a function. <clears throat> 5 j is one minus square root of one minus two j. Okay, it's a quadratic equation for phi. Of course, there's two roots for this equation and I've picked one of them. I've chosen to pick the root such that when j is zero, it gives me vanishing, okay? So I'm picking the root such that when there are no sources, I get triviality, which is the branch I want if I'm doing perturbative scattering. But this is just some function of j, okay? So of course, I wanna emphasize here that phi is no longer a functional of j. I'm thinking of it just as a variable phi, which satisfies an equation where j is just another variable. These are literally just numbers. Okay. Now, if you solve this and expand, then what do you get? You get j, a Taylor expansion in j. That's right, this is j squared over two factorial. I'm just writing the Taylor coefficients. J cubed over three factorial, 15 j to the fourth over four factorial. Okay. And the point here is that the, the Taylor coefficients of this expansion simply tell me the exact number of Feynman uh, 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 diagrams that are present for any given endpoint. Okay, so in other words, um, <clears throat> this here is simply saying that there's a single cubic diagram. Okay, this three here is telling you that there's three channels, S, T, and U, okay. and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a simple counting uh, approach to determining for any QFT the number of Feynman diagrams that contribute. Okay. And what you learn from this okay, is that if I define CN as the number of Feynman diagrams at endpoint, so the number of diagrams you have to compute at endpoint, then for phi cube theory, it's 2n minus 5 double factorial. Okay, which uh, hopefully you can see this. Yeah, you can see this. Uh, this, uh, this scales as 2 to the n n factorial. Okay, so the point here is that um, this is, of course, a very steeply growing function. I'm saying that the endpoint correlation function of five cube, which is all cubic diagrams, scales as n factorial. You can now do the same exercise for any theory you like. Okay, so I did this for for five cubed, but I can do this for Yang Mills, the non-abelian gauge theory. The same exact procedure to do the counting. All right, so let's take Yang Mills theory. And again, the counting here is really just a toy for um, doing a bookkeeping of number of diagrams. Okay, so of course, this is not the literal yang mills equations of motion. This is the yang mills of equations of motion. If I replace all diagrammatic elements with one, what I get is um, a squared over two factorial, which is the yang mills cubic. We have the yang mills quartic plus j. Okay. Same exact story. You can solve for this equation. The quarter, it's a cubic equation in A. There's three roots, but only one of the roots asymptotes to zero as J goes to zero. And you can again do the counting. And what you find is that A of J has J, let me write up some of these coefficients, J squared over two factorial, or times J cubed over three factorial, plus 25, J to the fourth over four factorial and so on. So what did we learn here? This one here is the gluon coupling, cubic term. These four diagrams are the uh, uh, STU plus the quartic term, okay? Plus S plus T plus U, the U channel diagrams, okay? And so on and so forth. Now, what you find uh, kind of amusingly in this setup is that if you compute CN from this, it's approximately the same, okay? Uh, it scales a little bit differently, but it, it, uh, it high powers, high values of n. It still goes as n factorial times some number to the n to the nth power. Okay. You can do this exercise for any theory you like. Okay. So this was the case of, of Yang Mills. We can do it for gravity. Okay, let me let me not do it in its full glory, but for gravity. And by gravity, what do I mean? I mean take um, Einstein Hilbert action for gravity, which is a function of the metric take the metric and expand it in some uh, graviton fluctuation field, and then just do perturbation theory around it. Okay? It may be something a little less familiar to some of you, but it's no different from any other EFT, for instance, even the Pi and Lagrange. It's actually very similar in structure uh, in terms of uh, power counting, renormalizability, and so on. For, for GR, you get something similar. Uh, let me not write it out, but just say 
uh, well, let me say schematically, what it looks like, it would look like h squared over 2 factorial plus h cubed over 3 factorial, an infinite tower of, of interactions plus j. Literally, all possible um, vertices, h to the n, are present in the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian in the standard picture, which would then suggest that it's vastly more complicated than the rest of these theories. In fact, I think very frequently you'll hear people and see people measure the complexity of a theory based on kind of the number of vertices present. Right? We think of phi cubed and phi four is simple. Yang Mills is less simple because that's got a quartic. GR is like super complicated because it's got an infinite series. Okay. But if you do the same exercise, you find the same fact, which is CN is essentially still dominated by some number to the n and factorial. And these are all the same order for the basic reason, which is that in both phi cubed, Yang, Mills, and gravity, the maximal number of diagrams are always coming from cubic, di cubic diagrams. Okay. You can add higher points, and they kind of make things complicated naively. But in terms of actual numbers of diagrams, cubic is what's killing you in all these cases. It strongly suggests that you know cubic is important, that formulating theories purely in terms of cubic uh, uh, structures is, is something we should be doing. And I'm going to talk about that. But the upshot here is the following, okay? Uh, GR is, the, is, is naively in this picture complicated because there's an infinite tower of, of, of couplings, uh, h squared, h cubed, h to the fourth, and so on. You might think that a scalar theory, which also has an infinite tower, would be equally complicated, right? So imagine a scalar theory where I have a cubic term, a quartic term, a five-point term, six-point term, certainly there must be the similar complexity. But I think the, the lesson I wanna show you here in the next uh, uh, set of examples is that that's actually completely untrue. Okay? It's actually the opposite. If I wrote down a scalar field theory that had cubic, quartic, you know, a whole tower of, of, of different couplings in general uh, with completely unfixed coefficients, it's actually a much more complicated secretly than GR, even though they have the same number of diagrams. The reason has to do with what I said about what's fixed by principles. And the fact is that every one of these couplings in GR is actually uniquely fixed, uh, at, at least at, uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, if, you're, if your coupling constant is G Newton, this entire tower is fixed by, uh, by symmetries, as we know, by different variants. But from an amplitude's point of view, we can think of it as fixed actually by even more primordial properties. For phi cubed, if I just threw down a bunch of random arbitrary coefficients, it's actually secretly much, much more complicated. Now this connects to a, grand, a, a deeper lesson, which I wanna just say, which is that often you'll hear in amplitude circles that n equals to four super Yang mills and n equals to eight uh, super gravity are like the most simple theories. And for those who aren't kind of in this, that seems very strange, like a strange thing to say because they have so many particles, they seem so complicated, but th those statements are true, okay? The reason why they're true is in those theories where there's so much symmetry and so much structure, there is ever more constraints relating couplings, okay? Couplings uh, and, and scattering amplitudes of different degrees of freedom. So even though you have to kind of pay the cost of having a multiplet of states, the actual amplitudes, if you go compute them, you'll find are vastly simpler than in another theory, okay? And uh, I'm gonna show you the kind of classic example of that, which I suspect that uh, many of you have seen, but um, I wanna unpack, which is the case of actual gluon scattering. Okay, so let's 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 take what I just said about gauge theory, and consider the five-point gluon scattering amplitude. This is kind of the usual thing that that uh, is described as the you know next to simplest type of uh, scattering amplitude you might talk about. Okay, so imagine I have an amplitude where I have arbitrary helicities up to uh, uh, five particles. Okay, so h1, h2, all the way to h5 are arbitrary helicities, and I just compute in Yang Mills the five-point gluon amplitude. Okay, so this is a big mess. Let's say use Feynman diagrams for this. You'll get terms that look like E1 dot E5. Let me just write out one of the terms. P1 dot E2, E2 dot E3, E3 dot E4, and then divided by propagators like P1 plus P2 squared. Okay, just to make it very concrete what we're doing. Okay, and then basically hundreds of other terms like this. Now, uh, you know, if you just use Feynman diagrams, this is, uh, this is the expression. If you, if you recall the numbers I wrote on the previous board, there's actually 25 different Feynman diagrams of this type. 
But each Feynman diagram is a whole spray of different inner products of polarizations and momentum. Okay? And this is just the, 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 the answer. Okay? This is like plus hundreds, maybe a hundred other terms. Uh, and one of the points about amplitudes is that this is vastly more complicated than the actual answer. Okay, so it's it's been rather famously known that uh, for actual physical kinematics. Okay, so if by physical kinematics I mean kinematics where the momenta sum to zero, and where uh, the external states are plus or minus helicity, let's say in four dimensions, which is what I'm going to restrict to for this present discussion then this is actually much more complicated than it looks. For instance, if I set all the helicities to plus, let me write it out, three plus, four plus, okay, the so-called all plus amplitude. So I'm working in conventions where everything's all in. So these are plus helicity all in uh, uh, gluons. Then this is actually zero. Okay, so like quite literally you plug in those, those helicities into this expression and your hundreds of terms all cancel with each other. Okay. Uh, on top of that, actually, if you even have one minus uh, anywhere, I mean, let's say you have one minus, two plus, three plus, four plus, five plus, it's also zero. <clears throat> so anything with um, all minus or all plus, or just one minus or just one plus, those are all zero. And what you're left with in, is, instead is the only non-zero uh, case, is the so-called uh, MHV formula, MHV amplitudes, where there's two minus or two plus. So I'll, I'll write this out once. Okay, so let's say one particles one and two are both uh, uh, negative helicity and three, four, and five are positive helicity. There's this beautiful formula, which for the special case of five point is, uh, is the following, um, two, three, three, four, Four, five, five, one. Okay. And for any case where there is uh, two minuses or two pluses, there's a simple expression, which is a so-called Park-Taylor formula, which is probably the, I think, uh, maybe the avatar for the uh, amplitudes program in terms of spirit, which is at any endpoint, for any endpoint scattering, if I have everything a plus helicity except for legs i and j, Okay, so the idea is that everything here is a plus helicity except legs i and j. And the Park-Taylor formula is ij to the fourth over cyclic string. Cyclic string of, uh, of, of uh, these objects, which are called spinner helicity variables. Okay, so uh, what are these angle bracket objects? I'm actually purposely going to talk as little as I can about spinner helicity because I know that Eugene is going to talk about it and I don't want to just give you something twice. Right. So I'm going to actually orient this talk to like carve out that discussion while still talking about the bootstrap. But just, uh, just so you, you know, know what I'm, yeah. Yeah, before you go, proceed. Yeah. Uh, simple question. First of all, when you define scattering amplitude here, uh, do you, how do you distinguish in state and out? Incoming and outcoming particles. Good. So, um, and uh, how about the mass dimension of this uh, amplitude? Uh, sorry, I didn't okay. catch the last, the second thing. Okay. The uh, how about the mass dimension of the amplitude? Oh, the good. So, the... yeah. So, I, I believe the mass dimension should work out. So, each of these uh, angle bracket objects has the moment has mass dimension one. Okay. Basically me here is sigma mu lambda lambda tilde. Okay, so these angle brackets are lambdas which are contracted as spinners. So any product of lambdas <clears throat> is equal to a uh, uh, product of two lambdas is equal to a p. Okay. So for instance for this uh, uh, amplitude here, this has dimensions four minus n, because there's four powers of this in the upstairs. In the downstairs, there's precisely n of these brackets cyclically, which is dimension four minus n, which is the correct dimension for the kinematical piece of a scattering amplitude, uh, endpoint scattering amplitude in four dimensions. So that's how the dimensions work. Yep. Uh, although again, I'm not going to unpack this a lot because I actually want to just uh, 
well, I'm going to actually use a lot of Mandel stems later, but let me unpack the second statement. Eutine will probably go into this in great detail. But uh, as usual, the definition of what is in versus out is that in a true physical process, P0, which is an energy, should be positive. So in states and out states should all be states with positive energy. When we take an in state, an out state, and we flip it, then we set its energy to negative. Okay. So basically, the, 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 the question of whether you're incoming or outgoing is a question of whether P0 is positive or negative, which places some sign constraint on these lambdas lambda tilde's. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers your question. It'll be unpacked much uh, later on, I think, by Eugene, but my, my goal here was actually to not go through the spinellicity. Uh, in fact, I didn't even tell you the kind of most important thing for those who haven't even seen these variables, which is these P's are, are, are simply related to regular old Mandel stamps in the following way. Okay, this depends on normalization. Okay. The idea is there's angle brackets and square brackets, which correspond to lambdas and lambda tildes. The angle brackets are all these objects I just showed you. Okay. And again, I'm going through it fast because my, my point here is not unpack and, and let you know and understand fully how spinner helicity works. My only point is that this answer is incredibly simple, immensely simple and much less complicated than the original answer, okay? And uh, this isn't just some random thing that, uh, in fact, there's a, there's a really amusing quote I wanted to read from the original Park and Taylor paper, because they wrote an 11 page paper computing, actually not five point, but six point, where they had eight pages of just algebra, okay? Stuff like this, okay? It's even more pieces, because there's 220 Feynman diagrams, even more complicated. There's nested algebra for eight pages. And then uh, they say at the end, this is kind of amazing. They quote, they, they hope to obtain a simple analytic form for these eight pages of, of terms, making this result not only an experimentalist's, but also a theorist's delight. And in the next paper, they wrote essentially the squared version of these formulas, the set of formulas, okay? uh, this formula in kind of its original incarnation um, with, with kind of that kind of classic uh, amplitudes approach, which is write the answer, find how simple it is, and then breathe structure and, 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 and learn something about QFT from it, uh, learn something about structure from it. Now you could easily ask, oh wow, I've, I've, I've gone very slowly today. Uh, you could easily ask now, what have we actually learned from this? Guys, I need to accelerate, sorry. Um, uh, what, what have we actually learned from, uh, uh, from this, uh, uh, this uh, picture? Well, actually very, very soon after the original Park-Taylor uh, Park uh, formula was written down, people realized that this actually had significance, like the structures here, where these angle brackets are, have dot products and there's various ratios of, uh, of, of spinner brackets. VP Nair realized that these are actually the form of uh, correlators in a 2D WZW model. So these look like co correlators in a CFT. Way later on, folks like Andy Schrominger and uh, people who study so-called celestial amplitudes have found new meaning of, uh, 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 in, in these objects as they relate to a possible holographic uh, uh, description of flat space amplitudes from a 2D CFT on the sky, where the two dimensions are the angles on the sky. Uh, Witten and others uh, uh, in, 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 well, Ed Witten in 2003 also read uh, uh, into this connection between this and the twister strength. So the point is like, just by staring at this formula, you can reverse engineer and understand tons of structure. Okay, maybe I need to accelerate. Okay, I think I'm going way too slow. Um, yeah, so, so I'll just say the next thing I want to say in words, which is that um, in the an expression I just wrote for the Park-Taylor formula, you'll notice it looks very different from Feynman diagrams. And I want to highlight that the one most important difference between it and Feynman diagrams, which is uh, the structure of its poles. Okay, so in a Feynman diagram, you have, you know, a bunch of elements and propagators connecting a propagator and then the rest of the diagram. And it has this property that if you localize the kinematics to some singularity, that is to say you tune the kinematics so that that propagator becomes divergent. So the one on P squared becomes one on zero, thus becoming infinity. It factorizes into two pieces. Now, uh, I'm not gonna rewrite that formula, but you'll notice in Park-Taylor, it's very confusing how that works. There's no one on P squareds. It, you know, if you tried imagining how they could come from Weinman rules, you'd be very confused. So one way of describing a lot of the on-shell methods and, and what we've learned is that they actually um, obscure this factorization property. 
this thing that's built into Feynman diagrams that we have propagators separating elements of a diagram. Um, we can of course obscure many things if we construct things without uh, uh, quantum field theory. Usually in quantum field theory, we build things that have locality, which have factorization, Lorentz invariants all built in. We can break all those. And I think I'll probably break all those at some point in this talk, uh, in the set of lectures. Now, uh, this was all for the case of, uh, of Yang Mills. Let me just say this in words. The same thing is true for gravitons, okay? So let's say you computed three-point graviton scattering or four-point graviton scattering, okay? So, and by this, I, I really mean take Einstein-Hilbert, the action perturb in, 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 those, in that H I wrote down last time and compute the four-point amplitude one minus two minus three plus four plus. Okay, if you do this with Feynman rules, you get thousands of diagrams. It's actually a hundred kilobyte file. So it would just be a giant mess, but it simplifies drastically into expressions that look like this for this particular set of felicity configurations over SDU. Okay, so the point here is that uh, gravity is massively simpler also. Part of this is the fact that spinner helicity variables are very nice. But I actually want to argue that some of it's beyond that. Okay. Now, um, uh, now everything I've said here suggests that all this redundancy. So, so the upshot here is that when you compute with gravity or gauge theory, things are way more complicated than they have to be. And of course, a natural culprit for that is the redundancy of gauge symmetry. Okay. So um, this would be the example for the case of let's say the photon. For the case of the graviton, there's a linearized uh, gauge symmetry or linearized diff symmetry. Okay. So the higher order pieces, if you want to do this uh, for the full uh, nonlinear theory. But uh, uh, the point here is that usually, or at least occasionally, it's described as gauge theory as a deep concept that is crucial to the way nature thinks about things. But of course, hopefully you know that gauge symmetry is an artifact of the way that humans have chosen to describe physics. It's an artifact because we like Lorentz invariants where we put four degrees of freedom inside a mu, but because of uh, the Wigner classification of, of the reps of the Lorentz group, we know that a photon, which is a massless spin one particle, can only have two polarizations. So we then have to introduce gauge symmetries and gauge fixings to remove those degrees of freedom. Similarly, a symmetric four by four matrix here would have 10 degrees of freedom, a usual story. And then we introduce gates and bridges to remove them. Okay. Now I want to emphasize here that this statement is not about the physics doesn't need gauge symmetry. Of course, that's why we gauge fix, right? You know, anyone who says gauge symmetry is deep has to explain why we always gauge fix before we calculate. We break that beautiful thing before it happens. And of course, it's because gauge symmetry is really a trick. Uh, if you like, from a practical point of view, it's a trick for having two things at the same time at every stage of the calculation. What are the two things? The two things are Lorentz invariants and locality. Okay, that is to say, when we write down the action I wrote before, d4x of this Lagrangian of a mu and its derivatives, we want to write down a local action. So all the interactions are local and it's fully Lorentz invariant. Okay? Now, of course, we know the physics has those properties, Okay, but we want a formalism that hard codes both at every step, and that's what gauge invariance requires. Uh, gauge invariance is born to achieve that task. If we throw out any of these principles, and I, by throw out, I don't mean, you know, forget that the answer needs them. Of course, the answer has to be local and Lorentz invariant, has to satisfy all the axes we usually think of. Um, uh, but if, instead, I mean, if you throw out having it manifest, Okay, so if, in other words, if you wrote a formalism where gauge where, where Lorentz invariance wasn't manifest, like if you went to temporal gauge or light cone gauge, or if you went to a gauge, uh, you went to a formulation where it wasn't manifestly local, which also exists, uh, those are all perfectly fine. Okay. Now, uh, okay, that's, that's just a, a quick kind of review of why all this redundancy is happening for gravity and gauge theory which is at a practical level that gauge symmetry enforces ward identities on amplitudes, they get complicated, and that's why there has to be many terms with relations amongst terms. But there's actually a huge redundancy even that transcends that, okay? So there's actually a, a, a redundancy that I think will even be uh, described in other lectures, which I'll call field basis redundancy. And to illustrate this, I wanna talk about a very kind of uh, amusing toy model which again is scalars. And I'm still just illustrating this point of why Lagrangians have 
have pitfalls. Okay, so imagine I gave you some Lagrangian that looks like a phone. Okay, so a single scalar boson, neutral scalar boson, which has, uh, if you like, higher derivative corrections, which are parameterized by k. So you have k phi, the first term is one, plus lambda one phi plus lambda two over two factorial phi squared. Three over three factorial phi cubed. Okay, so yeah, the point here is that I just think of k as some arbitrary function of phi that's regular as phi goes to zero. Okay. From an effective field theory point of view, the idea is I think of this as a, a higher dimension expansion. And of course, if to compute some observable, you'd have to go consistently to some order, depending on what you're measuring. But let me just imagine I define this theory in such a way. <clears throat> okay. Now, I wanna highlight here that lambda one, lambda two, lambda three have no relations. Okay. So there is absolutely no connection between these, uh, between these, um, between these uh, coupling constants. Okay. Now let's just compute some amplitudes in this theory and see, see what happens. Okay. <clears throat> see, uh, it'll become clear hopefully what, what I'm getting at uh, when, when we go through this. So if we compute A3, the three point uh, uh, amplitude, which is really just given by this, <clears throat> this is a vertex, which would be D phi D phi times phi. This object is proportional to P1 dot P2 plus P2 dot P3 plus three, P3 dot P1, okay? But this, crucially, each of these is related to the square of Mandel's dam, okay? P1 dot P2 for three particle kinematics is the same as P1 plus P2 squared over two. And P1 plus P2 is P3 squared, okay? So up to overall factors, this is P3 squared, this P2 squared, this P1 squared, which is zero, okay? So the three particle amplitude is vanishing. Okay, let's say you keep going, okay? So let's say you go to A4, okay? It's a little odd, you're like, all right, that's weird. L lambda one, which was controlling the three point function seems to have dropped out. In fact, I should probably put a lambda one here, a lambda one. Lambda one, it just drops out. Okay, you're like, that's strange, but maybe that's just some curiosity. Let's keep going, let's keep marching ahead. So um, uh, again, I'm gonna be schematic with the, the, the various factors because it's not important, but we have here, let's say there's some Lambda two here, which is controlling a quartic vertex because it's phi squared D phi D phi. So you can see here that what you're gonna get is some number times Lambda two times S plus T plus U. If you just compute this uh, quartic term, you have a P1 dot P2 and it gets summed over every possible uh, con wick contraction, which just permutes this thing and you get S plus T plus U, which is zero. Okay, this is zero. Of course, there's other pieces. There's a piece that looks like lambda one squared. Okay, so this is the piece that looks like two three point vertices that are glued together. Okay, so uh, let me write it out like this. So there's a one on S pole. Okay, so uh, let me just again harp, uh, unpack this a bit. This first term is the quartic contact piece, and this is the factorization piece. <clears throat> That's not fact. Let me. So this here, this here, maybe I don't know if you can see this. Maybe this is too low. Uh, yeah, let me not write it there because you can't see it. Oops. Um, yeah, so uh, you have a bunch of pieces here and I'm not gonna go through the details here, but what you'll find is that on shell, this is also proportional to S times S over S, giving you a single factor of S plus perms, okay? which in the end gives you also S plus T plus U equals zero. So I'll leave that as a calculation for you to do. Okay, let me just leave that as an exercise. But if you could beat the four point function, it's zero on shell. Okay, so I wanna emphasize here, it's crucial that we ask the physical question of three particle on shell scattering, four particle on shell scattering and so on, but the physical four point scattering vanishes. If you can be five point, six point, seven point, they're all zero, okay? <clears throat> now, why is that true? Okay, why do they, why do they all, why, why did they conspire? And I wanna emphasize here, it has nothing to do with relations amongst the lambdas because they're all totally arbitrary. Okay, so, um, let me um, 
let me first unpack the QFT reason why. And then maybe tell you about the, the, the technical way you would see it as kind of an amplitude person without doing the calculation at all. Okay, so there's kind of a, a slick shortcut to showing those are all zero, just as a level of the calculation. But let me just highlight why this happens. Okay, so the reason this happens is that famously there is a redundancy of the S matrix, which is a redundancy of field basis. Okay, so if you take, let's say, some partition function, some generating function of, of correlators, maybe explicit, so there's some scalar, <clears throat> there's some e to the i s phi, i j phi, okay. and we just send phi to some f of phi. Okay, now normally you would do this and say f of phi is some symmetry transformation of phi and ask for an invariance. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for just an arbitrary phi. Okay, we're, we're gonna keep in mind that the, that the Lagrangian we started with, okay, just recall the Lagrangian we started with was one half k phi d phi d phi, okay? But this, let me just tell you the claim and then I'll justify the claim. And I'm sure this may be even packed much more by, by, uh, by Mike Trott and by Alonzo Rodrigo, because this, this ties in actually closely with what's not relevant to SMEFT, the standard model EFT. But the point is that you can do this transformation and S matrix amplitudes are unchanged, okay? What I mean by that is if you do this transformation, which does not leave this Lagrangian the same, you get a different Lagrangian with different couplings, but if you compute all the scattering amplitudes, none of them are different, okay? This is a so-called Hogg's theorem or reparameterization theorems from QFT, but it's a, it's a, it's a naively an incredibly strange fact. It seems to be saying I'm taking a non-symmetry transformation and the S matrix isn't changing, how is that possible? But the key point is to realize the following, which is that it's no different from changing variables in classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, we go from, we do this kind of transformation constantly, right? So in classical mechanics, you could start in Cartesian coordinates and send Cartesian coordinates to a new set of functions that are definitely not a symmetry of the Lagrangian, which is to send Cartesian to polar. That operation does not leave the Lagrangian Invariant, right? Going from Cartesian to polar changes the function that your Lagrangian changes its structure. Okay, so it is not a symmetry transformation. Okay, it's a different coordinatization of the same dynamics. Now, the reason why, oh, I should have stipulated, I'm sorry, I should have stipulated here um, that it's important that f of phi has one constraint it must satisfy, which was expanded in phi. The first term is simply phi, while all other terms can be arbitrary. Okay, I should have mentioned that before. Apologize for that. We call this kappa two, kappa three, and so on. Okay, so the idea is I can do a field redefinition of this form. And the only stipulation is that F prime of phi is one. F prime of zero is one. So. <clears throat> now, uh, why is that? Seems like a weird set of rules. Basically, from a physics point of view, you can think of it this way. Okay, this is physics. I'll show you, mention precisely in a technical reason why this is true. But you want this piece to be the same because when the fields are scattering, you know, in the bulk, of course, all these nonlinears matter, but very far away from some scattering process, they're just plane waves, okay? And this field redefinition needs to map your asymptotic states, that is to say the free theory, the Fox states upon which you're building your QFT onto the same set of states, okay? So if you rescale this, it would be like rescaling the fields in your definition uh, uh, of, of your field operators for free particles, which you don't want to do. So that's why this first particle is actually fixed to one while other, all other pieces are arbitrary. Now, the reason you can see this as an invariance is that you can just do a change of variables. Okay? So send phi goes to f of phi. In fact, you can even call this f phi prime. Okay, if you do this, s of phi will change. There'll be a Jacobian, which, uh, if you want to do loops and you have very exotic field redefinitions, you'd have to keep track of. But actually for local field redefinitions in dim right, you can even ignore. But if you like, if you want to be very careful, you can keep all the Jacobians, keep this piece, keep this piece, and even keep this piece. And what you find is that all the S matrix, S matrix, S matrix pieces are the same. The only thing you might worry about is the source term because J will no longer be a source for phi, but of F of phi. But the difference between J sourcing F of phi and phi vanishes by LSD. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I welcome you to kind of go back to that 
exercise and how that works. But the point is when you apply LSE to an endpoint correlation function, what that does is you build a correlator of phi's and you apply box to, to the external states. What that does is it picks out the one particle pole. When f of phi couples to sources like j in, in, in quadrature like this, there's no one particle pole. So LSE actually kills off these pieces. Okay, so at a technical level, that's why the scattering amplitudes don't care. But this is a very specific property of on-shell amplitudes. If you compute something more sophisticated, like a correlation function, let's say in, in cosmology, a cosmological correlator, then you don't get to just do a field redefinition. You have to make sure you map correlators onto correlators in the appropriate way. Okay. But an incredibly huge redundancy, at least of on-shell scattering, is this choice, which is what field basis do you use? Okay. And in, in a standard model EFT, but in really in any EFT, in gravity, in any EFT you'd write down, there's always this ambiguity which is that um, there's always this ambiguity, which is that you can do a field redefinition and change your Lagrangian without changing the physics because the S matrix is the same. I'll mention this maybe very briefly because I, 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 maybe uh, 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 the others will go through this in a little more detail, <clears throat> but let me just mention, uh, this connects with something that you'll often see, <clears throat> let me call this five plus delta phi which is in effective field theory circles, sometimes people will see box phi inside their EFT and replace it with equations of motion, okay? And you know that can cause confusion to, just to maybe beginning students because you might be like, wait, equations of motion are true. On the support of equations of motion for solutions, if I'm in some off-shell action, why do I get to replace box phi with anything? Why do I get to substitute equations of motion into Lagrangians? Well, the key point is you're not allowed to do that. But at certain low orders, you can implement that effective operation with the field redefinition. So I'll just mention this briefly. And if, uh, um, well, if you have questions, you can ask me or, or I suspect we'll unpack later. But the idea is if you take an action and apply this transformation, what you get just by you know, usual Euler Lagrange variation is delta phi EOM. Okay, so the idea is I, I've just renamed F of phi this object. Okay, I've called this delta phi. <clears throat> I, the claim is that delta phi is arbitrary. So you can make anything you want and you can do this transformation. Okay. <clears throat> and the very first variation of I think of delta phi is small in some power counting or higher dimension operator is delta phi times equation of motion. Okay. Now, of course, there's other terms. There's delta phi, delta phi. There's a whole series if you want to do this exactly. But the very leading piece is like the equations of motion. So in other words, this here would be box phi plus something, yeah, you know, literally the left-hand side of the equation of motion, okay? So when people say that they can take terms in the Lagrangian and plug in the equations of motion, what they're imagining is instead finding some term that looks like box phi times an operator, okay? Imagine you have some EFT and this just showed up. The idea is that by identifying delta phi with theta or with O and then doing this field redefinition, you can eliminate that term at the slowest order. Okay, so the statement of plug-in equations of motion that you'll often see is again, just another incarnation of this ambiguity of field bases. And that's why when people write down field bases, there's many ways to write down the exact same physics. Okay, um, good, I'm five minutes over. Let me just uh, 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 end with the, the, the last thought. I didn't get to the bootstrap part, but this is a good for just introduction. Um, uh, what, what is the upshot of all this? So the upshot of all this is that not only is there gauge redundancy, and if you like diffeomorphism redundancy in gravity, there's also just basis redundancy. So if I give you a field theory of any type, even Yang-Mills or gravity or scalar field theory, I could send field to any function of field and get a new Lagrangian. Of course, I'll, I'll completely kill all the nice properties that I'm used to like Lorentz invariance, gauge invariance, any property you like, but the S matrix will be the same and the physics is the same, which means that there's essentially an infinite number of Lagrangians that are all physically equivalent. Okay, so this is a pedantic way of saying this. So, you know, let's say you go to your copy of Peskin and Schroeder and you pull out your Lagrangian for Yang-Mills theory. You can gauge fix, of course, an infinite number of ways. Uh, uh, there's many freedoms there, but you could also just do a field redefinition. You can do all kinds of crazy things. You can do this, of course, with gravity also. 
And I want to emphasize here that this is not a diffeomorphism of coordinate space. This is a much more exotic thing of a non-invariance of the Lagrangian. All these Lagrangians are not the same, but they all give exactly the same physics. Okay, because the amplitudes, the onshell amplitudes are identical. Now, uh, uh, what we're going to do in this, in this, uh, in the next lecture is basically start building these amplitudes without any of these. Okay, but let's say you were interested in something more high-minded than just rederiving old facts. You wanted to find new structure. Okay, let's say you're not satisfied with just uh, maybe conformal symmetries and 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 and. and uh, a supersymmetry and kind of symmetries we know of that we have a Lagrangian understanding. You just want to find a new symmetry, okay, of some type. Well, you could just take a Lagrangian like Yang Mills and just keep transforming it into various spaces, hunting for structure, right? That would be like stake, taking a Lagrangian in Cartesian coordinates and then transforming it and hoping to get to spherical coordinates and hoping there's a spherical symmetry. You could just keep mapping it to different field bases to look for structure. But a way more direct path is to just compute the amplitude directly like in that Park Taylor case, and then learn about the structure there. And then if you like, go back to a Lagrangian that encodes that structure, okay? So in this, uh, not in the next lecture, but the, the lecture after, I'm going to actually do exactly that. I'm going to talk about structures that have shown up uh, in this procedure. I'll focus mostly on something called the double copy, which is a color kinematics duality, which is a fact relating graviton scattering amplitudes and, and Yang Mills amplitudes. So connecting two pillars of the standard model of physics, if you like. The actual laws of physics have some relations amongst between gravity and, and gauge theory. And I'm gonna talk about how, we're, how there has been some progress in understanding this beyond amplitudes, okay? So maybe if, if there's any kind of uh, uh, sociological point I wanna make here is that while mo most of this lecture is gonna be on amplitudes and kind of doing it right, uh, I don't think there's a, uh, if you like a complete monopoly. Once you found the structures, you can always work backwards and we'll do that for a bunch of examples and actually ask what do these structures tell us about these other things. Okay, uh, why don't I stop there? Cause I think this is supposed to be one hour. Next lecture, I'm gonna go through the bootstrap. So next will be, next lecture will be like the basics of bootstrapping amplitudes. Uh, we're gonna build uh, Yang Mills and gravity, but the kind of key point is I'm not gonna use spinner helicity which is probably the, the way that most folks have seen it. I'm going to do it in general dimensions. That's the only kind of uh, additional twist. Uh, but with that said, why don't I why don't I wrap up to not take too much of your time and continue that discussion uh, tomorrow? I guess. Yeah, because I think uh, I'm ten minutes over. So sorry about that. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your great talk, lecture. Uh, before we have a question, I feel silly that I I forgot to formally introduce you to the students. I'm sorry. So the first lecture was the professor Clifford Chow from Caltech, uh, and that is really about that. And uh, any question from the lecture hall? Yes. This may be is a basic question, but so what was the bracket location? What, what oh, yeah. Like? Good. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I went through that quickly because I just wanted to show structure, but when we draw something like one, two, that bracket notation is lambda one, lambda two, alpha beta, epsilon alpha beta. So these are bosonic two component spinners, <clears throat> which encode all the information of momentum. So in particular, P1 mu is actually sigma mu, lambda one, <clears throat> lambda one tilde. Okay, so similarly, square bracket was the barred alpha dot, lambda bar, beta dot, alpha dot, beta dot. Okay. So the point is, every four momenta that's on shell can be decomposed into a bispinner. That is to say, two, a product of two, two component objects. These, again, I want to emphasize are not Grossman, but bosonic, okay? Because these are parameterizing not fields, but just kinematic variables. So if you like, this is like, these lambdas are the square root of momenta. And these angle and square brackets are their products. Okay, so these are the natural invariants under the, the two SU2s that uh, build the Lorentz group. And then, uh, yeah, uh, very nice lecture, Mike.
tractor. I just want to ask you a quick question on the recursion relations when you have so the, the examples you gave were kind of like pure theories like phi q gravity theory I know. So can you maybe say a couple words about when it's a more complicated interaction theory with like all sorts of different fields and how they're coupled to one another, uh, how we think how you think about that in terms of those recursion relations? Is there a direct analogy right. or just more complicated sources? Or That's a great question. Like yeah, I, I think what you do is you'd solve the full system of equations. So given a system of equations involving phi one, phi two, phi three, and a bunch of j's, there's a system. And then when you solve the system, you get phi one of j, phi two of j, phi three of j. So it's just a more complicated nonlinear set of equations, but you can still do the counting. What we'll do is fuse together all those Barron's Gila recursions into one, into, you know, into the final solution. <clears throat> yes, I thought it would work that way. So has it been actually worked out in explicit examples to show that that, that actually occurs? So I haven't tried it, but I'm certain I'm, I'm basically certain it will work if you expand around the right vacuum, right? The the only subtlety in this kind of cute toy is that if you don't start in a vacuum where J is zero, you're basically starting in some like other vacuum where the the you like the, the source is large. So as long as you start near the origin and solve perturbatively, you can solve any system this way, right? So it's it's basically just solve a set of of nonlinear algebraic equations perturbatively in the coupling about zero for all fields. So it, I think it will work. Yeah. Cool. That's a that's an interesting question though. Yeah. I, I have a question. Uh, so about the recursion relation is also pay for the we have derivative coupling from something. Sorry, uh, uh, I, I didn't catch what you said. Sorry. So with the derivative coupling is also, also uh, you uh, can use the yeah, recursion relation. This is my oh yeah. yeah. Oh, for the equations of motion for Barron's Gila, absolutely. Yeah, Barron's Gila. So there was the toy like counting exercise, which of course derivatives are bleached away because everything's one. But Barron's Gila works is a completely general fact about QFT. So in fact, Barron's Gila recursion relations have been written for higher dimension operators. We wrote down Barron's Gila recursion relations for gravity. Uh, you can formulate gravity. So literally just good old gravity in terms of Barron's Gila recursion relations for two fields that are of purely cubic interactions. This is actually a well-known fact. It's called a pal tetradic Palatini gravity. But in these in these theories, there's a graviton, and then there's a connection, and they're separately dynamical fields. But in this formulation, the perturbation theory doesn't have those very high powers of h. It has only cubic interactions. And you can write down Barron's Gila recursion relations with derivatives, you know, all kinds of stuff. And it's actually been used in I think for two loop gravity calculations um, to actually compute things. So yeah, absolutely. Barron's Gila is extremely general fact about any QFT that has locality. Uh, in fact, let me go even one further step. Barron's Gila is so powerful, it applies to theories that have no Lagrangian. <laughs> okay. an, an interesting example of this would be the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay. The Navier-Stokes equations do not follow from the variation of a Lagrangian whose degree of freedom is the three velocity. Okay. Uh, they're just famously not coming from that 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 kind of uh, uh, ver uh, standard Euler Lagrange variation, and yet you can still compute like an S matrix for them. People did this. There's, there's a whole perturbation theory. People had hoped at some point that it would help resolve turbulence and so on, which it didn't. But uh, you know, you don't need Barron's Gila in some sense is more general than even Lagrangians, because as soon as you have an equation of motion, you can perturbatively solve it. When people study uh, uh, another example is the effective field theory for large scale structure, which normally would sound like, uh, well, in, in depending on the formulation, there are equations of motion, which are again, are iteratively solved. So this kind of general picture of turning your problem of Feynman diagrams into an equation of motion, which you perturbatively solve, which is effectively Barron's Gila is very, very general. Yeah. <clears throat> Hope that answers your uh, question. second question is uh, so about the Lagrangian redundancy. I mean, so if you don't know about the uh, transformation loop from one Lagrangian to the another Lagrangian, we can distinguish this is uh, physically equivalent or not uh, besides calculating scattering amplitude or something. I mean, we cannot compare every scattering amplitude, right? So if there is any ways to distinguish this is these two. Good. Right? That's a good question. Yeah, if I just give you two theories, <laughs> How would you show their equivalent? Okay, so um, excellent question. So in field theory, we also don't know the answer to that, right? So if I gave you a theory of, a, of, a, of an axion or a theory of a dual axion to a two form, 
And I said, prove to me they're equivalent. It's subtle, okay? I mean, maybe not super subtle, but in perturbation theory, you have to do a little work. Uh, for scattering amplitudes, you might think, oh, it must be impossible because I can only check up the endpoint, right? Now, the proxy to checking a full theory is the following, which I'll talk about in the next lecture, on-shell recursion, okay? So the idea is, give me a theory, which, is in, which has some structure. Uh, if I look at the low point property, low point, uh, uh, if I look at amplitudes at low point and I just study them, I'll understand what physical properties they have. For the case of the axiom I mentioned, it's gonna have a shift symmetry and that encodes uh, amplitude statements that I'll discuss actually at length, something called the Adler zero. Now, uh, if you wanted to prove that two formulations of this theory were the same, you could start both by computing the low point amplitudes and using what's called recursion to derive the full tower of all other amplitudes. Okay, now, uh, uh, so, so, so basically answer your question, like if you were just doing order by order, three point, four point, five point, you know, you never prove anything. But the point is, uh, I will show you how uh, there's automated ways of kind of doing this. So it's not just artisanal, like, you know, every time you give a new amplitude, you have to start from scratch, where you actually just recursively build the full S matrix, at least in perturbation theory, at tree level, let's say, and then you can show they're equal. Now, if you want to ask about your question at higher order, like loop order, then it's much more confusing. But or not perturbative, it's super confusing, of course, from, from this point of view. But I think um, uh, that is awful, often complicated if you don't know the mapping of Lagrangians anyway. So, so there is some advantages and disadvantages, but the upshot here is that if you give me two actions with Lagrangians that spit out amplitudes, if there's some set of physical principles that their low point amplitudes actually exude and I can hard code into a bootstrap, then I can prove their equivalence because I just have to prove that both actions are fixed by the same principle. Um, Hopefully, it, this sounds very abstract, but hopefully it'll be more clear when I literally talk about pions uh, next lecture. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so we start here with the massless field, so it can be can break for the massless field also. Ah. Yeah. So everything I said. Okay. I said many things here. Um, the statement about field basis redundancies is just a fact about the, the world. Yeah, that, that doesn't matter if you're massive, massless, higher spin. It's a statement about coordinatization. Fields are a means to getting to some physical thing. They're no different from R theta phi. So, so that, that transcends masses. Spin or helicity, in terms of the niceness of expressions, they're usually nicer for massless degrees of freedom. Uh, uh, there exists massive spinner helicity that maybe Eugene will even has developed. He's one of the, 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 the uh, initiators of it. Uh, uh, so there is a massive kind of extension of these ideas. But let me just say at, at a physics level, I would say the upshot is that massless theories just genuinely are simpler. That is just true. Uh, being massless changes your numbers of degrees of freedom in a discontinuous way. And that is constraining to a theory, which is why gravity and Yang Mills are more constrained than Proca Yang Mills and, and massive gravity. Like what, that's why once you start adding masses, like unfixed parameters are born from nothing because masses, uh, uh, yeah, a massive particle just has more freedom intrinsically. Now, of course it is not UV complete generally and you have to you know, add a Higgs mechanism and that's a different set of constraints. But I would just say kind of invariantly, if you're bootstrapping an amplitude that's all massless particles, most of the time it's some unique simple fixed thing. That's massive, there's freedom, but that freedom is the same freedom you find in a Lagrangian. I could put it that way. Like this isn't a new freedom. This isn't a disadvantage of the amplitudes program. Every time an amplitude bootstrap gives you a free parameter, it's something that you could have written in a Lagrangian and it's equivalent currency. So, and part of this is me trying to demystify that there's any magic. There's no magic. When we do bootstrap, we're just doing the same thing you could have done in a Lagrangian, um, but in kind of a simpler or cleaner way. Um, the magic and the win is when you find new structure. That's the win, at least in my view. Like finding things that have no analog in, 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 in kind of standard QFT or symmetry uh, 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 circles. Yeah. Are there any questions <clears throat> from the uh, Zoom audience? Yeah, I, okay. Go ahead. This is the last question. Uh, yeah. uh, I think we'll. We are due to a very special form of function. Like, do you have a regular function 
multiplied with two derivatives of five. I mean, how about another general form of multiplication? Excellent question. Yeah. So for this toy example, I wanted to take an extreme example where there's a field we definition that maps that to a free action. I'm, I, I'm sorry if I didn't even emphasize that properly, but for a proper choice of field redefinition, this maps to d phi squared one half. Okay. Just for a choice of f of phi, I can invert this and write this as a free theory. I probably didn't emphasize that enough. Uh, the statement that I was making here is that these were all zero because the theory we're mapping to is secretly free. But you could have started with any Lagrangian that's not free, where all the amplitudes are non-trivial, done the field redefinition, and in your new theory, all the amplitudes would be the same. Okay, so I was, I, I apologize, I, I was giving this as an example of a kind of a surprise where this Lagrangian gives trivial scattering amplitudes because it's field basis equivalent to a free theory, but you could take an, a theory that's not equivalent to a free theory, like gang mills or gravity, and literally do this operation. Okay, in fact, maybe in a couple of lectures, I'll tell you how you can do this for gravity like literally for gravity. Take the graviton, rewrite it as an arbitrary function of the graviton and just check that the amplitudes don't change and they don't change. And that's an, of course, an honest to goodness interacting theory. So I, I welcome you to do this for any theory you like. Take five, four theory. So take, you know, take it's the five, four theory or QED, what, it doesn't matter. Do any field redefinition that satisfies that linear, that, that first term having coefficient one whatever you like, and then compute the amplitudes. You'll just see they're all, they all are unchanged from before. Um, so yeah, the, the, the statement I'm making is completely general. Yeah. But thank you for that clarification. That's an important question. Yeah. There are really more questions, but they, I think the, the session is quite uh, delayed. Uh, and uh, maybe it's time to stop to uh, this lecture today. Let's thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you tomorrow. Uh, I think this uh, uh, Yutin, are you uh, Yutin? Uh, would you mind uh, 10 minutes uh, shift of your lecture? So can we start at 11 10 to have some time? Yeah, sure, no problem. Oh, okay, thank you very much. So okay. we will start at 11 10. Uh, so some now coffee break. Thank you. Thank you.